We're going to move on. Uh, a cl very close friend, uh, Saibal Carr. Dr. Saibal Carr is going to sort of, dis and has been the, what, at the forefront, one of the leaders uh, of the transcatheter mitral technologies, especially the mitral clip device. He's going to give us an overview of the procedure as well as the, uh, the, the re current results available. Good afternoon, everybody. Once again, Shashil, Marty, and Srinivas, thank you very much for inviting me to this conference for the second time. And these are my conflicts, minor consultants for Abbott Vascular and consultant for GDS, major conflicts with my cardiac surgeons. This is just a joke. I, re I really don't have any conflicts with them. So we know that the treatment for MR is surgery, and the treatment of choice is repair rather than replacement. But as we know that in certain number of cases, you really can't replace, repair the valve when you replace the valve. And even if you do so, you pay a price from surgery, and that is the morbidity and mortality associated with surgery, especially in high-risk groups of patients. And therefore, there is a need for something less invasive and potentially safer. There are several approaches to percutaneous valve repair, which are basically adopted from surgical techniques. There are several companies built around these, but the one that seems to have led the way is leaflet repair, and the device is called the MitroClip, and the owners are now Abbott Vascular. In order to be a successful procedure, it's got to be based on an established surgical principle. So it's based on the stitch, also known as edge-to-edge to edge repair, or the Alfieri stitch, where you convert a single orifice incompetent valve into a double orifice competent valve by actually suturing the malcrafted segment to the normal segment and allowing a double orifice valve. The second thing is that, as you know, when this technique was made, it is applicable to a larger population. It's effective in degenerative MR with a flail posterior leaflet, or if you have functional MR where a localized part of the mitral valve is actually malcrafted. And in his original article, he actually mentioned that this concept could be become the perspective of percutaneous technology. Unfortunately, he never patented his idea, but he realized this simple technique could be a percutaneous approach. It's helpful for a wide variety of patients. It's a percutaneous access and not a cut down because it's a venous procedure. And therefore, it has important implications being a venous procedure. There's lower vascular complications and probably lower vascular strokes from that. And finally, it's safe and effective both in low and high-risk patients. And it's got to be repositionable and removable. And that's a criteria for any percutaneous approach. Ideally, it should be repositionable and removable. And the MitraClip seems to have established most of these criteria because it is a clip rather than a stitch. And therefore, it allows the leaflets to be crafted together without actually causing holes in the leaflets. And if it doesn't work, you can actually unclip, reposition, or if it doesn't work at all, you can actually remove the entire system. So this allows it to be removable and positionable. The entire procedure is performed in the cath lab. And you don't need a very sophisticated hybrid cath lab. You don't have to have a hot line machine there. Importance is that why does the simple stitch actually work? And these are probably the three mechanisms. It helps to crap the leaflets together in the places where it's malcrafted, reducing MR. It creates a tissue bridge between the leaflets and therefore reduces the annulus from dilating. It helps in the durability. And third, potentially causing a rain effect between the leaflets, the clip, and the cords, it actually maintains geometry of the ventricle. So this is a very relaxed atmosphere, no rapid pacing, no heart lung machines around, the anesthesia is falling asleep after putting the patients to sleep, and then the whole procedure is done under echo guidance. And the whole purpose of the procedure is to go transeptal in a very specific location, try to negotiate the clipatory system right in the middle of the valve, open the clip, advance the clip into the ventricle, and then gradually withdraw the clipatory system, allow the leaflets to fall onto the clip to the system, lock it, and then see if there's a reduction of MR. And the final thing is to achieve this picture over here. You can see over here a symmetrical orifice with a double and the clip, as you can see over here, very well sutured. Now, if you have an MR originating from the side, you can actually put that clip slightly on the side. So you can position the clip wherever you want. So this is an example of an 86-year-old lady with severe degenerative mitral regurgitation who was in the Everest 2 clinical trial. She was randomized to the clip, and this was it after two-clip procedure. 
uh, you can see over here, you've got a tra actually trace MR. I must confess this is a perfect result, but this doesn't usually occur in all cases. But this was a proper case selection with two clips. And then you can see the hemodynamic results with the V wave decreasing and the cardiac output going up. And this is what the baseline is. And then you can see this at four years, she's actually had no symptoms. She's on no medications excepting a baby aspirin with no episodes of congestive heart failure. The worldwide experience seems to continuously increase and now we're crossing close to 6,000 cases, about th over 3,000 cases as commercial and about 1,500 cases in research studies in the US. And I'll start with a couple of things. First, the Everest to randomized trial. Everybody has probably heard of this trial, which is a random, the first randomized study between a percutaneous valve repair versus surgery. It was randomized two to one for moderate risk or low risk patients. Extremely difficult to enroll because these were low risk patients. And, but the good thing was that every single patient had prospective echoes and followed up systematically up to five years. Now we knew from the one year data that it was safer than surgery. It, there was definitely less reduction of MR, but they seemed to be at one year equivalent clinical benefits. Now this is the three year data of that same study. And you can see over here, the three year data shows you very interesting category. You can see over here, if you divide them between uh, degenerative and functional, and if you see the mortality curves, both in the surgical arm and the percutaneous arm, as far as degenerative is concerned, there's actually no difference in mortality at three years. And so is with functional MR. And functional MR, actually, you can see there's actually a difference in the first one or two years, and then it seems to have flattened out. So you, you do lose the patients in surgery in the first one or two years. If you look at freedom for mitral valve surgery, and I think this is a very important curve to understand, that on the surgical side, you see it's a flat curve where the surgery for degenerative MR seems to be very effective, and we know that. Now, if you look at it on the mitral side, and this was the biggest um, criticism that we faced, that you can see a significant portion of patients actually went for surgery, and that usually occurred in the first six months. And thereafter, it seems to have stabilized after six months between one year to two years and two years to three years. And the reason why this is important is to tell you that possibly the reason why this happened is because we really didn't know the proper case selection. So these were patients who went early for surgery and then thereafter flattened out after that. So the, if you have a localized mitral valve disease where it was effective, it does seem to have at least durability up to three years. If you look at freedom for surgery for FMR data, now look at this curve. Even though it's a very small number, you can see in the percutaneous arm, you can see over there, again, same thing, they do very well. On the surgical side, we actually show recurrences. In fact, this curve would have been even worse in favor of surgery because a significant portion of patients with FMR in the study actually underwent a replacement. And if you could actually divide the group and see how many of them got repaired and how many actually came back, you'll see at least 20% or 30% recurred after just a ring placement of FMR, which actually gives you a hint that percutaneous valve therapy is probably the treatment of choice for FMR because the surgical repair techniques for FMR are not that great. So this is the MR grades. You can see over here that there is reduction of MR at two years. This is one year, two years, and three years data. You can see a significant portions are being two plus to one plus. But what is nice to show is that it seems to be consistent both at one year, two years, and three years. On the surgical side, you can see the reduction of MR is much greater. And you can see that most of their patients have remained between zero plus or one plus, and a small proportion is two plus. And they, of course, have remained constant over three years. And this is the FMR data, which again tells you the mitroclip arm, which is a very interesting group, that with mitroclip, this doesn't seem to get worsening of MR, even in spite of a clip. This is different from surgery where we know if you just treat it with a ring alone, there's actually a 30% recurrence in three, four years. On the surgical side, they also did well, but again, you must remember, a significant portion of these patients actually underwent replacement. And this is the improvement of functional class, which is consistent at one year, two years, and three years, both for the surgical as well as the mitoclip arm. And if you look at the volumes, there's actually a reduction of volumes, both in the mitoclip as well as in the surgical arm, consistent with reduction of MR. Uh, if you now 
continues to show. So if we summarize the benefits of three years, the benefits seem to have sustained till three years. Regardless of the etiology, few patients convert from mitral valve surgery between six months to three years. And the mortality in the mitral device arm beyond six months was related to the morbidity of the patient, not related to the actual procedure. If you now go to the Everest two results of the high-risk surgical risk group patients, you can see here there are about 372 patients who have been considered to be extremely high risk. And the average mortality score in this group is actually 15%, the actual STS score. And 60% uh, of these people actually have had previous surgery. So this was a consistently a very high risk group of uh, surgical patients. And you can see over here, this was not randomized. This is just a registry. But you can see the actual mortality of 30 days is 52 against a predicted mortality of 15%. So we think that this is quite good as far as safety is concerned at 30 days. Uh, if you now look at the all-cause mortality at 30 days and one year, 5.2 at 30 days, 24% at one year. That means about 75% of patients still alive at one year. Uh, the MR grades are the same as the Everest 2 randomized study, and these also showed LV remodeling, functional class improvement, and finally, most important is this slide to demonstrate that the benefits of reduction of MR actually translated into reductions in hospitalizations from congestive heart failure. And this is an important clinical surrogate, especially in heart failure patients. So a conclusion is a low 30-day mortality, evidence of MR reduction in LV remodeling, improvement in functional class, and reduced rates of hospitalization. So what is it in, my, in clinical world? In the clinical world, if you look at the changes that have taken place, in the Everest 2, we went for moderate risk patients with 73% degenerative. In the Everest 2 high risk, it was changed to a lot more functional MR, much more high risk. And in the real world, that's exactly what it is. 77% of people is FMR, 23% DMR, mostly high risk groups. And there are over 3,000 patients worldwide experience a much higher success rate, exceeding around over 90%, and the procedural success is going up to 98%. So that's 3,000 cases about with a low complication rate. The whole thing about FMR is blown out, and we realize this is a true unmet clinical need because this is a group of patients not very well treated, and uh, it's an uncommon operation for surgeons themselves. In fact, the surgical treatment for FMR is actually very difficult. In fact, there are more rings than surgeons. And for some surgeons actually have three rings in the name, which basically tells you that there's no one good solution for FMR from a surgical standpoint. And mitral valve surgery is not that great because you see if you have an end, systole, end diastolic diameter of greater than 65, your mortality at one year is almost 50%. And this is one small study showing the data for patients who had functional MR, very low ejection fractions, and had a full treatment with a CRT device, and these were failures. And you can see there were 50 some patients who all got a mitral therapy. So these are patients with cardiomyopathies, with CRTs, with severe MR, with a very low ejection fraction. And you can see the 30-day mortality was 4.2%. The 12-month mortality was only 18%. And look at the improvement of time, both in the functional class, in the MR grade. And you can see the improvement is almost instantaneous and continues up till one year. And this is the example of one of my patients. This is actually the first patient with an ejection fraction of 20% to be ever treated in the world. And this is her MR before. This is what it is at five years. This is a couple of weeks ago. And this is what her dimensions were, 63 and 57. And now it's 51 and 41. And she continues to regress. She's had a CRT, a mitroclip, and continuous medical therapy. So this leads to future studies. The future studies are the two important studies. A COAP study in the US, which will be read by Greg Stone and Michael Mack, and the RESHIP study in Europe, which is studies on functional MR. And this is an important to demonstrate because we've already shown feasibility data that it's, it's good for FMR. Now we want to know whether it's actually better than just medical therapy alone. And so this study is basically going to randomize 400 patients in 75 US sites into 210 to mitroclip plus medical therapy versus just medical therapy with CRT. And there's going to be follow-up up to four to five years. 
This is our own experience of 151 patients. Our primary success is 95%. Our hospital mortality is 0%. Our periposterial stroke is 2%. And surgery for failed clip is 13 And what I really want to talk about is surgery for failed clip procedure. And you can see of this data, uh, I want to show you one of my cases. 57-year-old lady with a degenerative MR presents five years later with worsening MR. You can see an eccentric jet. The patient, as you can see, has a greater degeneration of the lateral aspect of this valve because of progressive dilatation of the annulus and degeneration of the leaflets. The patient underwent a robotic mitral valve repair with removal of clip even at six years. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because there's a lot of misconception that the valves cannot be repaired. And that I think is not true. And I always tell people that if you think the valve has to be replaced, don't replace the valve, just replace the surgeon. So this is an example of her now six months later with trace MR after six years. So we can conclude by saying that the MitraClip is a novel first-in-class percutaneous treatment for selected patients with significant non-rheumatic MR. The emphasis on the word selected, the emphasis on the word non-rheumatic. Compared to surgery, it provides increased safety, less reduction of MR, equivalent clinical benefit. The mitoclasp is safe and effective, especially in high-risk surgical MR patients. The durability has been demonstrated for three years, and trials have been designed to establish the role of it in functional MR who are not indicated for surgery. Where do we stand? I think there are three places where it will be used. High-risk MR patients, degenerative or functional. Functional MR itself, and that's where the condition, even if they are low risk, but there's a trial on this group of patients, and only selected low-risk degenerative MRs. Now, this is the controversial point, and it is like TAVI. It has to be a team effort. Thank you very much. Sabah, that was terrific. A, a tour de force um, uh, explanation of both the technology and what the clinical outcomes are. Um, and again, this is a device approved in Europe and hopefully coming to a cath lab near you.